for My two. story, well, I was born in a little village just outside of Shrewsbury called Dorrington, where Netley Hall is. Um, I'm sure most or some of us have been there with the church. And I had a mother and dad, obviously, and an older brother and an older sister. And it was a loving family, although very poor. I went to a small local school and then on to a grammar school. First of my family to go to a really good school, uh, where I absolutely wasted my time, <laughs> wasted every opportunity I was given, and was extremely stupid and ill-disciplined. Why was I stupid? <laughs> Thanks, Kath. Man with microphone have all power. Why, why was I ill-disciplined? Why did I play up? Why was I stupid? Well, the truth is, and I don't think I've ever admitted this to anybody, insecurity. You see, I had to put on a, an act, a joker's mask, because I thought people would like me, and they wouldn't if I didn't. So I was a deeply insecure and ill-disciplined young man. Then I started work, um, always manual jobs, and now, and for years, I've been driving for a living. Um, when I started work, we started going to a local pub. Pretty much the same thing, lots of acting up, same insecurities, same messing about, going around the local pubs, causing havoc, having fights, getting drunk. Usual sort of thing, really. Because I was insecure. And then I started coming into Shrewsbury, meeting up with some of the local gangsters and reprobates, some of whom have become Christians. One of them actually comes to this church. I'll get back to him. <laughs> That's when I started drinking again. Got into various drugs, lots of fighting. Made me feel good. I don't know, adrenaline, less insecure. Don't know. But eventually, I got married. And I settled down. But I thought it was all too good to be true. I thought it didn't deserve happiness, didn't deserve love or kindness. And so, my own, these are my own fault, my marriage fell apart. And I fell apart. I was suicidal. I was in a terrible state. Do you know what I did to make myself feel better? See, I was quite financially secure. So what I did was I used all my credit cards to buy lots of things. Not for me, but for other people. Because I thought that would make them love me. Because I felt insecure and unloved. And then one of those reprobates, one of those gangsters I mentioned earlier, whose name, he isn't here today, actually, which is quite sad, his name's Paul Bailey, started speaking to me about Jesus. I mocked him. I thought it was ridiculous. But he persevered. That's showing love, isn't it? He even sat in my little bed set until seven o'clock in the morning talking to me and then came round the following morning to pick me up to make me go to church. <laughs> How much love is that? I liked it. It was Barnabas Church, by the way. I liked it. Didn't believe a word of it, but I liked it. And these people seemed to sort of have something they shared, and I didn't get it. Couldn't understand it. That's why I met Roger and Joy. I love Roger. I still do. Joy was scared of me. <laughs> Ask her. I still didn't believe it. I, I, I really went to, to church because I wanted money and they did debt help and I thought they'd give me money. If that sounds cynical and horrible, well, I was cynical and horrible. If you really want to know how cynical and horrible I was, ask Terry. He will honestly tell you how cynical and horrible I was and what a nice person I really wasn't. I did an alpha course because I thought they'd give me money. I still didn't. But I liked it. One day I was out 
from the library van. And I wanted to ask God if he existed. I'm sure lots of you have heard this before, but I wanted to know. So I asked him what two and two was. And no. No, there wasn't a big finger pointing from the sky or any clouds and thunder claps and that. But a friend of mine then rang me and said, and she wanted to ask me about Sky Television, and she said, I don't know why Tim, but I get the feeling I need to tell you that the answer you're looking for could be four. That moment changed my life. You see, that moment, I found out what love was. Because all that cynicism, all that insecurity, all that anger, and all that fear lifted off me. Like that. Gone. Taken by a God that I didn't believe in, who I denied and mocked. My life changed. Jesus loved me so I can love. Brought me into a loving community. This loving community. Brought together by the love of God. Look around you. Come on, don't just lie at me. Look around you. Lots of loving, happy, smiling people. <laughs> all different, but all brought together by the love of God. So thank you. All of you, thank you. Thank you for loving me. Thank you to Paul for sharing his faith. Thank you for, thank you to Terry and Helen. I don't think I've ever done that before, but thank you. Who put up with me, persevered with me, helped me, led me and loved me through lots and lots of very bad times. <laughs> Who've gone from church leaders to loving friendship, but mainly Thank you to my Saviour. Thank you to my God, Jesus Christ, who changed me and saved my life. Amen. Thanks very much, Tim. It's fantastic. Huh? Yeah, I want to try and... Uh, build on what uh, Tim has just shared so helpfully, so movingly, so powerfully uh, as we think about God's love uh, and Tim has sort of shared it so, uh, so personally in terms of his own story of, uh, of God's love just breaking into his life, hijacking him as it were. Uh, and so with that in mind, I just want us to think just for a few minutes about the whole issue of God's love. And do you know what? It's, it's a big subject to do in 15 minutes. Um, but uh, we'll see how we get on. Uh, how's your dinner? Is it cooking? Uh, oh, you should be coming on a picnic, so it serves you right if it burns. Um, so, God's love. <laughs> someone fainted then. Um, so, <laughs> so uh, Grace, good point. Um, so, God's love. Uh, I mean, love is just a massive subject, isn't it? Love in itself is huge. Where do you start with love? You know, how do you define love? Love is used in so many different ways, in so many different contexts. I love my hamster. You know, I love chicken tikka masala. I love football. I love my mum. I love my wife. I love my kids. Whatever it is, I love. There's just such a vast range that you can speak about when it comes to the whole issue of love. Uh, I was uh, at a wedding, uh, was it last week or week before? Recently, uh, we were at a wedding, Helen and I, and I was able to speak, and I had the opportunity of just speaking at this wedding, and I spoke, uh, I actually focused in on the, the, the most negative part of the vows. I thought that would be, be encouraging for everyone. Most people weren't Christians, so I thought, you know, this will really, really encourage them and help them. And so I talked very particularly about that little bit, which says, death, us do part. And actually the reality is that we were there and we were celebrating the love that this couple had for one another. But at the same time there was that very solemn, stark, serious bit there. You know, it, it does talk about love lasting a lifetime. But actually, you know, when people get married they think their love's going to last forever. And I was sort of blowing that out of the water saying, well actually, 
death has to part. There is a, there is a point at which uh, love ends. Even the most precious marital love, there is that point. Uh, and where I was going with that was simply to say, actually, is there such a thing as a love that lasts forever? See what I did there? Um, and so is there a love that actually not even death can separate us from this love? And of course, then that brought us beautifully into God's love. God's love is the only love that is eternal. And so with that in mind, we're just going to spend a moment or two looking at that today. And I just want to read from a few lines from a letter that Paul wrote to the church in a town called Ephesus. Uh, are there people coming in and out, or do you want to just shut that door, John? I don't know. There's one that's nursing outside. Oh, okay. So, okay, sorry. Um, I'm not too worried about the noise, but I just wanted to see who was coming in or out. Uh, Ephesians uh, uh, chapter 3, reading from verse 16, just four verses, and I want to speak particularly on the last three that I'm going to read, 16 to 19. This is what Paul writes, and the context is he's praying for these guys. He's praying for these Christians in this church in Ephesus. And he says this, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all of the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, so that we might be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. And so, I want to make three points from three verses, uh, and then we'll see how it goes. Very, that's classic sermon, isn't it? Do you think? Well, I feel pleased anyway. Okay, so point one is simply this. Verse 17 talks about us being rooted and established in love, or some, some translations use the word grounded, rooted and grounded in love. And so what we're talking about here is love as a foundation. Rooted is like an agricultural term. Grounded is like an architectural term. Or a, build, oh, a building term. You've gone. That's it. It's gone. It's gone. It's gone. It's gone. It's gone. Okay, uh, yeah, so um, rooted and grounded in love. Uh, grounded is a uh, very much agri- uh, uh, architectural term, building term. Uh, and so I just, uh, my first point is simply this in regard to God's love. God's love as a foundation. I believe that right at the very heart of all of our faith is the love of God. Now you might say, well, that's very obvious, Terry, but I'm just I'm going to take it a step further. In, in the context of the gospel and in the context of the cross, I would say the primary thing, the primary element is the love of God. Now, we, would, we might argue that you know, the cross is about lots of things, and of course it is. The cross is about our sin. The cross is about Jesus' sacrifice. The cross is about atonement. The cross is about God's wrath and God's justice. But primarily, I say to you, The cross is about the love of God. And we come right back to John 3.16, which is obviously the most famous verse in the Bible. God loved the world so much that he gave his son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. In in, uh, uh, the same writer, uh, in his letter, 1 John 4 verse 10, he says this, this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. So right at the very heart, my first point is simply this, God's love as a foundation. It's right at the very heart of the cross and the resurrection. It's right at the heart of our Christian faith. And foundationally, we start with God's love, rooted and grounded in love. My second point is simply this, God's love is a truth that we can grasp and get hold of and try to understand in our minds. And Paul here, he says, for us to get to know, to know and to understand the, the height and the width and the length and the depth of his love. And so it, it's like a bit like an intellectual exercise. It's something that we fill our minds with. Uh, and I want to encourage us in terms of studying God's Word in terms of looking at our Bibles, actually day after day after day as we look at God's Word, we discover more and more. Every page or page after page after page is full of the examples of God's love, 
God's love for the broken, God's love for the marginalized, God's love for the oppressed, God's love for rich and poor, God's love for those that otherwise would be despised, God's sacrificial love, God's purposeful love, God's determined love, God's eternal love. Over and over in the Bible we can read and we can fill our minds with the love of God. And so I want us to be, I think it's almost like Paul's sort of provoking us a little bit here. He's saying, come on guys, see if you can run as far as you possibly can. Let's see if you can reach the end of the length of God's love. Or you know, why don't you go as deep into God's love as you possibly can? Do you think you can find that bottomless pit? Do you think you can get to the bottom of the depth of the love of God? Uh, I think probably the answer is no. Um, there's, a, there's a wonderful theologian and preacher called John Piper. And he talks about God's love in the context of heaven. And he says that as we come into heaven... We have this opportunity to explore more and more of God's love. And he puts it like this. He says, God's love, you know, in the first instance, he imagines it to be like a, a beautiful and glorious and wonderful mountain. It's the most beautiful and the biggest mountain we've ever seen. And to climb that mountain is no sweat. It's not a hassle. It's not hard for us. It's just to explore it in all this glory and wonder and beauty. And as we climb that mountain, it takes us 10,000 years to get to the top of that mountain. And it's just been so beautiful and so glorious and so wonderful. And then as we come over the peak of this beautiful, glorious, wonderful mountain of God's love, and we just look and then there's another mountain. It's taken us 10,000 years to get to that one. And then there's another one which is even more beautiful, even more glorious, even more huge and massive and incredible and wonderful. And, and so we climb that mountain and it's just a glorious and a wonderful and a beautiful experience as we explore more and more and more into the love of God. And we reach out to 10,000 years or so, we reach the top of that mountain and yet there's another one. And on and on it goes. And John Piper's making the point that actually in terms of our minds, in terms of our mentality, in terms of the cerebral aspect of our being, we will go on forever. We will explore God's love in our minds and we will never get to the end of it in terms of the length and the height and the breadth and the depth of God's love. Uh, and so that's my second point, really. Simply that. The first point is God's love as a foundation. The second point is God's love as a truth that we're trying to get to grips with, that we're trying to grasp, that we're trying to understand. And the, th the third point is actually uh, very, very, uh, it sort of leads on beautifully from the second point, because Paul, uh, Paul in effect is saying, you know, try guys to get a hold of what God's love is with your mind. And then in verse eight, verse 19, he then says, to know this love that surpasses what? Knowledge. What? Oh, Paul, what are you doing to us? He's saying the love that you're trying to get hold of and you're trying to know surpasses knowledge. It's beyond just the theory, just the intellectual aspect, just getting hold of the truth. It's more than that. Why is it more than that, Paul? Well, he says that we might be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. And so we move from love as a foundation to love as a truth which grips our minds and, and we grasp to intellectually understand. We move to the third thing, which is, I believe this, God, love, God's love as a lived experience. Beyond our intellectual knowledge, we can experience the love of God because he presences himself with his people. We can experience it. We can actually, and so intellectual knowledge is really, really significant and really important. But we also need to experience the presence of the love of God in our lives, the living presence and the power of God. You see, if, if the last point that I talked about uh, relates to God's truth, as we're trying to grasp intellectually God's love, this point relates to God's power. And so we've covered all three in one go, God's love, God's truth, and God's power. Because here we're talking about the power of God, the presence of God coming upon us, surpassing our knowledge, surpassing what we can intellectually get hold of, and touching our lives. And I believe that uh, it's different, Knowing something in theory is different to experiencing it. Yeah. Isn't that true? I, I find that true. I, let me talk, talk about being a parent. And we've got brand new babies here today, Lyra uh, and Louie. They sound like a, like a comedy actor, Lyra and Louie. It's fantastic names. Uh, and uh, they, 
that they brought new babies. And I just so remember when, you know, before I had children, I was like, uh, I would imagine when I have children, I'll probably quite like them. I'll probably, you know, it'll be hard work, but I'll probably love them. I suppose, I guess, you know. Uh, parents in the room, yeah, we get that. Um, <laughs> And then, and then Isaac was born, and obviously it was the same with Ruth, but Isaac was the first born, so it was the first experience. So the theory was in my head as to what I would think about kids, and then I remember Isaac being born and laid in my arms for the very first time, and my eyes looked into his eyes, and as far as I could tell, his eyes were looking back into my eyes, and, and I just wept, because I suddenly realised that I just loved this tiny life so much and my experience was so, so different to my theory, if that makes sense. And similarly, let me give you one other example in my life, driving tests. <laughs> See, in, in theory I'd sussed it, I thought this is straightforward, I'd read the highway code, I'd looked at what you're supposed to do, but the theory was so different to my first test where I went the wrong way up a one-way street. <laughs> Do you know what, the, and, the, and the theory, and really getting, to hold, getting hold of understanding it in my mind was, was so different to my second test when I tried to do a three-point turn and mounted the curb and nearly killed the pedestrian. <laughs> the theory was so easy, but the experience of my third test as I turned off a major road into a side road where children were and they had to run for their lives. <laughs> was so different, and so, I mean, I could go on, I could go on, but I won't, but the reality is, the reality is, I'm trying to illustrate simply that theory and experience are two different things, uh, and I, my desire for me and for each of us is that not only do we get it in here, we receive it in here. That we experience the love of God. How, says Paul, in order that we are filled with the measure of the fullness of God. Overflowing with his love. Uh, and, and actually, that's all I'm going to say. Uh, um, I just, I would love, what I would love to do, John, yeah, just say to Isaac, we're, we're done in a minute or two. But I'd love us just to have that moment, or even now. Oh, my, oh no, I'm not here. No, 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 no. Uh, he's out with the kids. Um, let's let's just be quiet before. I wonder if we could just close our eyes. Let's just open our our hands to God if we feel we're able and we can do that. Let's just open our hearts and our hands to God, because actually, even here, even in the here and now, we can experience something of the love of God yes. touching our lives. Do we believe that? Yes. just going to play just quietly for us just be quiet before him for a moment Father God we're so glad that your love is a foundation and we're so glad that your love is a truth that we can really get hold of and grasp but I thank you too that your love is a lived experience we can actually receive your love and I pray for me and I pray now for my brothers and sisters in this room and I pray too for people who perhaps have not yet experienced the love of God in a tangible way and I ask something which is straight out of your word Father, straight out of Romans it's Romans 5 say Father God by your Holy Spirit please would you pour your love into our hearts Let's just open our hearts to God now. Father God, please come by the wonderful power of your Holy Spirit. Touch our lives. I pray that you would bring hope to people's hearts. I pray, Father, you would bring joy to people's hearts. If they're feeling downhearted, I pray you would lift them. In the prayer meeting earlier, Kevin was praying, raise us up. Father, raise us up into a place of hope and joy. I pray for peace in our hearts, in the midst of the turmoil and the, the challenge of life. Father God, please, by your Holy Spirit, bring love into our hearts, which gives us hope and peace 
and joy. I pray, Father, you touch lives even today, right across this room. Holy Spirit, come in power, I pray. Continue to move upon people's hearts and lives. Continue to bring refreshment. Continue to bring, I pray for healing, Father, healing of hearts. I pray for your love to touch hearts that are broken and sad and sore. I pray for physical, emotional and spiritual healing even today, even in this little place in Hasket, that you love to dwell amongst and presence yourself. Thank you so, so much, Father God, that by your Holy Spirit you are present with us right now. What a glorious thing. And we say thank you and I pray, Lord, that not just now, not just in this moment, but day by day, we would not only understand your love as a foundation, we would not only grasp your love with our minds intellectually, but we would also, Father, encounter your love as a lived experience, day after day after day, in Jesus' name.